Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. I'm Stephanie Singer. I'm the manager of lectures and special programs. And on behalf of the JCCSF, it's my pleasure to welcome you to BookFest Sunday and the keynote event that you've been waiting for, Nicole Krauss in conversation with Elizabeth Rosner. Today's program is made possible in part through the Toby Corrette Center for Jewish Peoplehood, Linda and Sandy Galanter, Lisa and John Pritzker, and the Ingrid Tauber Philanthropic Fund of the Jewish Community Federation. BookFest sponsors this year are Harper One and the Center for Literary Arts. And also I'd like to uh, give a shout out for our, to our community partners, all of whom are listed in your brochures, and many of whom are in the atrium. So stop by and say hello and take a look at some of the things that they like to offer you. And thank you all for coming and for your support. So now is a perfect time to double check that uh, you've turned your cell phones off and fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a busy, provocative, energetic day, and you have some tough decisions to make about what to see over the next few hours. Joyce Carol Oates or Ben Marcus, Harold Bloom or Adam Levin, Cynthia Ozick, Phil Levine, Tomorrow night, Word for Word presents uh, Peter Orner's Esther Stories, and finishing out our festival with a bang Tuesday night is the legendary Claude Lonsman. And be sure to find a few moments today uh, to make your way to the Cat Snyder Gallery on the second floor to check out Brian Detmer's book, Sculpture. It's amazing and something to behold. And also, um, take a look inside the, uh, the Beit Midrash Library. We've got some wonderful books and some backlisted books of, of some of our authors, in case you want to take some out on loan. But this morning, we're all here in one place for Nicole Kraus, and we are delighted to have her as our keynote. Nicole Kraus is one of our most critically acclaimed young writers. Her third novel, Great House, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Writing for the New York Times, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein called it, quote, a high wire performance, only the wire has been replaced by an exposed nerve, and you hold your breath, and she does not fall. Nicole Krauss is also the author of Man Walks Into a Room and The History of Love. In conversation with Nicole Krauss is novelist Elizabeth Rosner, author of Blue Nude and The Speed of Light. Please join me in welcoming them both to the JCCSF. Hi, everybody. It's a privilege to share the stage with Nicole Krauss. And uh, I want to begin, chronologically at least, with your first novel, Man Walks Into a Room. Um, and I want to say also that it, it seems to defy logic to talk about your books in a linear way, but I'm going to pretend that there's okay. a linearity here. <clears throat> At the center of Man Walks Into a Room is an absence, that is, a man's 24 years of erased memory due to a brain tumor and its surgical removal. One of the most painful aspects of this experience is the character Samson Green's discovery that he has no recollection of his mother's death, and so he mourns the loss all over again. I'm just going to read a little passage. It was as if he had closed his eyes, and then, when he opened them, he was old and she was gone. As if she had taught him everything she could, and this was the final lesson, to touch and feel each thing in the world, to know it by sight and by name, and then to know it with your eyes closed, so that when something is gone, it can be recognized by the shape of its absence, so that you can continue to possess the lost, because absence is the only constant thing, because you can get free of everything except the space where things have been. I, you know, the reason I hark back to that is many of you, I'm sure, have read all three of these beautiful books, and I'm wondering if this was something you discovered as you wrote that book, or was it an idea that uh, you were holding? And, and it's a phrase I had heard before, the presence of the absence, so was that something that grew inside you? 
Well, it's interesting, of course, when you write a novel, you find out things about yourself that you didn't know. And I always find that I don't know what I'm <coughs> thinking about or what my concerns are until they're reflected on the page. And when the book is finished, there's always that moment of, ah, oh, that's what I was writing about this whole time. And I think that you're, you're absolutely right to suggest some kind of link between all three of these books, and in a strange way, as different as they are from each other, maybe there's a way in which you could also look at them as something of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I say that simply because I think, at the core, they are all concerned with the idea of of course, solitude, and the difficulty of crossing, uh, transcending sort of the, the space between people, mm -hmm. of, of being understood and of understanding. But I think that they, they are also all about the idea of how does a person respond to catastrophic loss. And in a way, starting to write my first novel at 25, I mean, I had no idea what I cared about and what I thought about, but I was drawn to this idea of somebody who has to start with nothing, who has this erasure and has to create a self out of that. And over time, and then I wrote The History of Love and then Great House, I began to realize that actually what, what really interested me was not so much catastrophic loss, but this response to it, which is, a kind of recreation of the self, this incredibly powerful use of the, ima the imagination. Um, and I think memory is an imaginative act. We can talk about that. This idea in which one can reimagine and remake oneself. Um, and so it, I think it started with that, mm -hmm. not so much an interest in the absence, but what comes after it. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does one feel it afterwards? Mm -hmm. So the other thing in that in Man Walks Into a Room that's so striking to me is the idea of connecting by way of shared memory, that that's um, in a way both the resolution and the problem in that novel is um, the goal of, of this scientist, this researcher, to get into other people's heads, and yet um, the idea that there are mysteries buried so deep inside of us that they can never be shared and that we may not even know what they are. And um, so I'm thinking about E.M. Forster's phrase, only connect. And so what you said about um, that goal of connecting is partly the writer's goal, right? That, is that what also of motivates course. you to I write? I mean, it's interesting yeah. to have written a first novel that is about the idea of how, also how does one empathize? Because Man Walks in Room is, you know, very much concerned with the idea of if you lose your memories, how do you relate to another person? Of course, how we relate to other people is by saying, I have had similar experiences, I can put myself in your shoes. And then that the compassion comes out of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how, how can you relate to someone without that? And this question of what it means to empathize with a person. And I, I, ha I think um, it, it was my way of deciding what kind of writer I wanted to be, that, f that first and foremost, in my ambition was going to be to try to step in other people's shoes. Well, I think it's the thing that excited me most as a young reader growing up, and even now, what it feels like to open a book and suddenly become, have this chance to become another person and to understand the, the thoughts and motivations and minuscule feelings of that other existence. And it's absolutely thrilling. You can't find it anywhere else in life. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing Man Walk Syndrome and I was thinking about all of this, I suppose in some way, I think there was also part of me that was thinking, well, is there any other way to, for this to happen? I mean, outside of literature or outside of these sort of unique, strange moments in our life that almost feel mystical when we have a kind of serious connection with another person. And so there's this kind of, well, playful idea of what would it be to have this scientist or this kind of science fiction moment of somebody who imagined sh shortcutting that process, that long and arduous and complex process of empathy. What if we could just somehow stand in each other, like have some, you know, wire, these weird wire mics were like <laughs> attached to, and, and I could feel what it feels like to be you. And somehow that seemed so cheap, of course it couldn't work, you know, and I remember the time when I was writing that novel, somehow I had been reading Antonio Damasio, and I got his email address, probably it was the email address of like his third assistant or something like that. Mm. But anyway, I wrote and I said, you know, I'm writing this novel about this man and blah, 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 and I'm trying to think about what would, what would the science involve with removing a memory from one person's mind and channeling it and planting it to another 
person's mind. What would that look like? I know it's impossible. To look like. And I got back this one line response, which is, um, change your plot. <laughs> <laughs> the dreaded words that no writer wants to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I stubbornly and probably wrongheadedly persevered with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, that was at the heart. Yeah. I mean, again, it's so interesting to think about that as a first novel. I always think, why did I write that book? And it, there's so many revelations that came after writing it. Another yeah. one was, I mean, a, a really a, a kind of dance with the idea of the past and Jewishness. Mm. I, I couldn't quite leave behind the idea of writing a Jewish story or a Jewish character. So I made the character half Jewish. Mm. So it was like a way of like, like this kind of deal <laughs> with my, um, my ancestors staring down at me um, and, and, and also a desire for freedom. I wanted to be free. I didn't want to have to write something that I was bound to write or responsible mm. to write. I really wanted to claim my freedom as a writer. And I had come out of writing poetry and some, somehow found myself trapped in that and was really, I thought I was just gonna switch and write a novel just for a little while to regain that freedom, mm. which was so much of the, at the heart of writing for me. And so I made Samson Green half Jewish, and that was, the, that was sort of a contract um, mm. with something for me. And I thought, okay, this is, all, this is all made up. This has nothing to do with my family and my past. And at some point I realized, at the very end of the book, Samson Green ends up in California with his great uncle Max, who was survived, a German Jewish refugee who survived the war, who has Alzheimer's. I realized, I, in the end, I wrote this book about my family. I tried so hard not to do it, but in the end, I wrote this book about this person who's forced to start a second life. Mm -hmm. And that was the story of all of my grandparents mm -hmm. who were all born in one world. That world ceased to exist. They all had to leave, and, and they all had to live and begin second lives elsewhere mm -hmm. with some memories, but with, with, a, with a kind of... Um, the loss of a world mm -hmm. and the need to recreate another one. So, I mean, uh, so many things were in, the, in that strange little story mm -hmm. that, that started just with this idea, oh, I'll just write a novel, like what a lark, you know? Mm -hmm. And here I am all these years <laughs> later, still well, dealing with the repercussions. There's another passage from that book before I move on. Um, it's uh, referencing when Samson Green was teaching English and he apparently gave some Talmudic lesson that he has completely forgotten giving, but the angel of forgetfulness, whose job it is to make sure that when souls change bodies, they first pass through the sea of forgetfulness. How sometimes the angel of forgetfulness himself forgets, and then fragments of another life stay with us, and sometimes those are our dreams. I wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He doesn't remember, you don't remember. Um, <laughs> but the beauty of, of your saying that, and I believe you, um, is I want to know how you find yourself dropping in so purely to the voices of your characters that mm -hmm. are so evidently not your voice, but, but ring so true for readers, for us. I think it's one of the great mysteries of writing, how that can happen. And it surprises me. It must surprise you when that happens to you as a writer. I, but I know that it, it can't happen with every character. If, if someone from the audience were to you know, pass me a character or a story, probably everyone, if everyone in, in the, this audience gave me their idea, I wouldn't be able to write any of those ideas. It's just that one character or that one story that I happen upon somehow through all these mistakes and accidents of trying other things. And it feels authentic to me. I feel mm. like... I could be that person or I am that person. And it's always this very complex marriage between this act of invention, total invention. How could I be an 80-year-old man staring death in the face who's survived the war and is, is living in the lower earth? How could I be that person? Of course I couldn't. And yet, I don't know. There, I, in certain ways, there's no character I've written that's felt more like me. Mm. I absolutely felt that I was writing myself when I was writing Leo Gursky, and there were things that I could touch about my feelings about life <clears throat> that I just simply couldn't touch or express in any other form except that way. And, and if, it, if I don't have those two things, that, that sense of in, the freedom to invent and a feeling of being absolutely authentic, of touching the most authentic, true thing that I know is 
me or real or my experience of life, then it just won't work and I can't write the story. Mm -hmm. It just takes a long time to find that character. Mm -hmm. I love that you said, and yet, buried in that, because and yet is this right. recurring <laughs> phrase of, of Leo's. And uh, it's, so, it's so uniquely his, but I love that, that we just heard you say it too well, in your own yeah, way. Yeah, the story of that, how I came upon that phrase, are all of these, these moments in writing where you may have your character, but like the mortal breath hasn't been blown into him yet or her yet. And it happens in the course of stumbling in the language. And I, I so vividly remember looking at this really long sentence I had where Leo Gursky is saying something, and it began with, and yet, blah, 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 blah. And I was just looking at one day, and I thought, what if I just like, brought the period forward? And so what if it was just, and yet, period? And suddenly there was that moment where it's like, OK, he just came alive, because somehow in that phrase was all of the yearning of how much needed to be said, how much was on the, on the, just on the cusp of being expressed, and yet also this hesitancy, this inability to say aloud things that needed to be say, said aloud, mm -hmm. and the sil this silence that he'd held within all of these years. Mm -hmm. And all of that feeling, all of that was there in just that, f that simple two-word mm -hmm. phrase. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful phrase um, that reminds me, too, of the epigraph. And now we're talking about the history of love. I naturally quietly segued into that book. But um, because the epigraph for that book is, um, well, it's dedicated, really, to your grandparents who taught me the opposite of disappearing, which is another gorgeous phrase. And so there's something about and yet that, to me, is the, the opposite of disappearing. It's, it's the voice that keeps trying to speak speak the unspeakable. The yeah. Maybe. So I'm wondering if um, you've, you've already mentioned maybe some ambivalence you had in the first book about the Jewish, the Jewish layer mm. of your writerly self. Mm. And, um, and the solution to that was to write this half-Jewish character, Samson Green. So the history of love is, is so much more of an overtly Jewish book. And I'm wondering if that, if that expanded your sense of your writer obligation or commitment as being beyond the personal and into the collective? Well, there's a certain point in which you realize you are who you are and you just have no choice. I mean, there's, you know, you can't like become a Boston wasp and write about that experience. Like, I don't know what that would look like. And another thing dawned on me, which is that there's an incredible richness in the, in the atmosphere into which I was born. All writers are born to an atmosphere. It's the one that we know of, and, and I assume that they all find them rich. And I found this incredible, bottomless sense, a place that, that could be mine. I mean, I, I think as time has passed, you know, it's interesting about starting with a character who's half Jewish. I feel like now I've driven myself into a corner where I can probably only write like rabbis and Talmudic scholars. <laughs> it's, getting like, it's getting terrible. But, <laughs> But I have found myself more and more drawn to my material, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. And interesting things have begun to happen, too, to me, in thinking about it, which is, I mean, we haven't gotten to Great House yet, but I should say one thing about it here, which is that it is very much a book about uncertainty and about ambiguity and about doubt. And at some point I realized, I mean, it's also a, a book that um, to some degree touches on aspects of Jewish history in the diaspora, and I realized that this sense that I have that writing must be about that, that for me writing is always about this pursuit of this kind of willful uncertainty, the importance of asking the questions rather than providing the answers and, and, and just sitting with doubt, what it means to sit in that very uncomfortable place of not knowing for sure. But that is kind of, of all the things I have inherited from kind of Jewish intellectual legacy, that is the, mo the, the, the most powerful to me. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I thought about that, how that's kind of in my blood um, and has really deeply influenced in ways that I'm only beginning to recognize how I think about my own work, how I think about literature, really. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, this interview that you gave in which you talked about the novel being a true home. And then in an, maybe in a different place, um, you quoted Rilke saying, we are not really at home in our interpreted world. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, you know, some of what you're talking about, that, that discomfort that you recognize as 
maybe not uniquely Jewish, but inherently Jewish, and that that working with the discomfort, that feeling of home restlessness, homelessness, does that factor in? Yeah, I mean, I think well, when I'm when I'm talking about when I'm talking about uncertainty, the discomfort of uncertainty, I'm also talking about um, the way, just to clarify, the way in which, like for example, the Talmud, like might be the only sacred book in the world that demands that we doubt and ask questions mm. and argue. And such a, there's such a beautiful idea in the Talmud or in all really rabbinical writing and thinking, which is that if you find a solution to the argument, if the argument is finally settled, then that's kind of a failure on the part of the rabbis. Mm. The idea is always to keep the argument alive mm. and aloft. Mm. Um, and I, lo I, mean, I love that. That's where I want to live when I'm working, mm. um, not talking about rabbinic things hopefully, mm -hmm. um, but just simply keeping the question alive and, and, um, and grappling with the uncertainty that I think is all of ours. I mean, it's certainly not a Jewish idea, but the, the, that we have to like s make our lives not knowing for sure whether we've chosen the right life, the right anything, mm -hmm. um, but we've committed to that life, um, and we have to, you know, I think there's, um, I once heard Sharon Perez say that, um, the greatest Jewish gift to the world was dissatisfaction. <laughs> Can you relate? <laughs> there's really something to that, like the, yeah. the way in which we're taught not to take things at face value and to f turn them over and inside out. And as soon as you do that, you begin to find the, the cracks and the flaws in things, and you have to deal with that. You have to open those, those mm -hmm. ambiguities up. Um, and I'm drawn to that mm -hmm. in my work. And now I can't remember what else you asked. About well, that. that's <laughs> a great answer okay. um, because it, you know, secretly we were talking earlier in the green room, we weren't supposed to be, but we were, and um, talking about this whole process of architectural design. Your, your novels are so beautifully complex in their construction, and I've heard you say elsewhere that, that writing is very much a process of being lost for you, and, and so... Well, you were asking about the idea of home. Of yeah, art, yeah, yeah. Well, this all links together, I think, because I do think writers, when they're writing novels, are trying to create a place for themselves in the world that they feel at home that they haven't been able to find. I, I don't know that that's the case for everyone, but that's my instinct uh, to say that. And I, I have always felt that the idea of home is incredibly elusive to me, just in a, uh, in a geographical way. I mean, my family comes from so many different places that there's never been any one place that I was ever taught to consider as here, this is mm. home. Mm. And there was also always this sense that home was a place that was in time, that you could, we couldn't go back to the place. That, so this sense of, um, of, the, of trying to search for that or create that or somehow put all these pieces together and then maybe I could create that place which is home, that home is maybe an, a history or something, mm. who knows mm. what. Um, but, but then I suppose that's linked to the idea that for me, whenever I'm writing novels, I always think of them, I've always thought of them as houses. And that when I'm actually, I, th I think of building a novel in the way that I think of building a house with lots of rooms. And I'm al I always feel as if I'm building it from the inside. So I never have the blueprint or the plan or even the vision for what the house would look like. It's just like starting with these very, very tiny details. So like a character or a place, or I always think of it like as a doorknob, but then I have to find the door that is appropriate for that doorknob. Now I have a door and the doorknob, but I have to mm -hmm. open the door and then I have to build the room and I have to build the adjacent rooms, and it's only as the novel is coming to an end and I have this huge rambling structure that, that has been calibrated and balanced and, you know, the whole time as I'm working, the structure is constantly changing and shifting. Then, as I'm finishing the novel and walking away and locking up the door, I see what the whole mm -hmm. thing is and looks like. That's that's marvelous, and <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a lot better than it actually. Is. <laughs> it, it you know for me it's so much messier than that. But um. I didn't say it was a neat house. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm. You uh, you invited me to ask you about the image of the suspended piano. Um, if if you haven't visited her website, um, there's. There's just a gorgeous, um, it's somewhat animated, I guess you could say, and there's this, there's this moment where the, this piano is being hoisted slowly um, above the structure and, and some other line drawings that are really beautiful. But 
Can you tell that oh, story? Oh yeah, I, I was yeah. just I was thinking about it because I don't know if I ever had told it, but there were a number of images that were sort of lingering in my mind as I wrote this book, not knowing what place they were going to have in the book. Um, but we're talking about the Great House. Great House. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them were just very mysterious images to me, like the idea of this shark in this illuminated tank that has all these wires attached to it and like sort of electrodes and wires and the, the wires go to these dreamers who are all in these separate rooms dreaming these sort of dreams or these nightmares and all of those are being channeled into this shark in this tank who absorbs them all. It was such a strange idea but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it, it got incorporated into the book, and, uh, but at some point I realized that it was a way of thinking about the structure of the whole book, um, all of the, uh, almost the shark itself as the, the novel and all of these dreams and dreamers sort of go be mm. going into it. Um, one of these images was something somebody had told me, you never know what's going to stick with you, but I, I had been at some dinner party, and somebody had told me about uh, a carpenter they knew who had been a really great pianist. And he, he played piano growing up and maybe even thought about becoming a professional musician. Um, and at some point, he stopped playing because he couldn't bear the fact that the notes, you know, of course, a note, when a note is sounded in a piano, the strange and beautiful thing about it is that it, it dies. I mean, each note you're hearing is sort of dying, this extended death rate. It's played, the hammer hits the, and, play, and then you, you're also hearing it sort of slowly vanish into silence. And he couldn't bear that the piano sat on the floor and d somehow disturbed that. I don't know how that would exactly work with sound engineering. Maybe mm. the guys up in the <laughs> box can tell us. But somehow that disturbed him. And he thought the, the true way that a piano should be heard is suspended in the air. And it was enough that it, the, the purity of that made it impossible for him to continue playing. And so at some point, this guy is obviously um, an interesting mind. Um, <laughs> and gifted in a lot of ways and, and, and became a carpenter and finally built for himself in his apartment, which I guess must have very high ceilings, this contraption <laughs> where he managed to suspend the piano. And he's able to, I don't, I've never saw it. I met him once and asked if I could come see it and I think he didn't feel like inviting me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, which is probably good because now I can only imagine it, but I kind of imagine him in this like trapeze-like thing, so he's sort of swinging, you know, not quite <laughs> touching anything and playing this piano, but there's something about the beauty of the image, this piano mm -hmm. hanging above everything, threatening always to come crashing down. Mm -hmm. How could you possibly make something strong enough that you know for sure the piano isn't going to fall? But also the idea of a kind of artistic purity, the dedication to something which, um, if you can't do it that way, then in a, w in a certain way, then it's not worth doing. And mm -hmm. at the, the cost at which, or the extent the lengths to which you'll go to preserve that purity mm. of vision. Mm. Somehow beautiful, I think. That um, leads right into this other question I have from Great House about, um, it's, it's echoed in the history of love as well, um, but it's this idea of always trying to write the book that's impossible to write. You know, mm. that the, it's sort of, I don't know, maybe the platonic ideal of the book you're trying to write. And I'm wondering, does that anxiety haunt you as a writer? The, yeah. the writer in Great House is, has, you know, panic attacks, really. Um, and, and no matter how many books she writes, she's always aware of the one that eludes her. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think that's probably why I keep writing. And every time I finish a book, I always think to myself, this little secret thought, which is now, now I'm ready to write my first novel. Mm -hmm. um, as if I've learned enough now to know mm -hmm. how to do it. And then of course that always fails. And every novel ultimately is also to the writer a record of failures. Um, which isn't to say that one is glad that it exists and glad to have written it. But you know, we, when a novel starts, you have an infinite number of possibilities. Anything can happen. And it's all open. And at, with each decision you make, you cancel out all these other possibilities mm -hmm. that could happen. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that that's the right decision? It sort of goes back to this uncertainty factor. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But you sort of commit to these storylines and characters. And, but as you do that and the book progresses, you have fewer and fewer choices that you can make until finally when the book ends, there's only one way that it can end. And although it often takes a long time to figure out that one mm -hmm. way. Um, but you're kind of locked in. That freedom <laughs> diminishes. Mm -hmm. So some, sometimes I think, well, you know, what is the book that keeps that freedom 
alive throughout, or I don't know, what is the book that somehow I was born to write? And maybe it's an idea that's problematic because every book ends up being <coughs> unsatisfying in some way. Um, but it's also maybe something to keep, it keeps me hopeful about mm. the possibility of writing. Mm. Another, I remember I was once speaking to Amos Oz and we were talking about this idea. And he was saying, well, what's wrong with just in knowing that life is long, you know, write a lot of books. Some of them will be the ones you meant to write, and some will be mm -hmm. small, and some will be big, but not every book has to contain everything you have. And when I heard that, I thought, that's such a relief to think that way. <laughs> he thinks that way. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I could think that way. And, and it's interesting because I very often have thought when I'm between books, which I am now, just trying to start a new one. I always say this, I was like, I'll just write a small book just a little book. I'm just going to write a small book and it'll just take me, it won't be very long, it'll just be this little small book, then I'll go on to the other room. But I never mm -hmm. end up writing this, like a small book. It, mm -hmm. I always, it has to, once I get going, I feel like it has to somehow contain everything. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember who said it now, but when asked which is his favorite book, he always says the one I haven't written yet, mm -hmm. you know, of That's the ones nice. he's already written. Um, yeah. So, it, it's that Jewish dissatisfaction thing yeah. again, too, probably. Um, can I just ask a question? Is it freezing in here? Yeah, yeah we're, sh it's we're like shaking up here. I'm, okay. I'm shivering. I'm they trying. told us that you were all going to warm us up with your body heat. <laughs> done Start that. sending more heat our way. <coughs> um, thank you. So, uh, the other phrase, um, like and yet in the history of love, one of my... Um, favorite phrases that recurs in Great House is pass over it. Oh. Um, mm. Do you remember that? And, uh, and there's, there's a, there are so many voices in all of your books, but um, you said in some other interview, I feel like I've been stalking you for the past few weeks because I've been watching mm. all your interviews and everything, but... Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the book begins it's like my with mom. <laughs> <laughs> the book begins with that that voice saying your honor and mm. and you said that there was some moment when you realized that that was um, yeah. that was going to change everything about who was speaking and who she was speaking to and yeah there that the beginning of Great House started with this short story that I'd written and I put it away I, I published it I I just thought it was finished. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about this character and her situation and circumstance. And when I went, when I returned to it to kind of open it up, you know, take out some of the seams and see what was there, one of the first things I did was put that, those two words there, your honor. And suddenly it was as if, again, like it, the, the, the character, the story just stood up, bristled and stood up mm. and came to life in this new way. Because suddenly it was a confession and when a person is confessing to somebody, well, there's, this, there's the possibility of guilt, of course, especially when it's confessed to a judge, although what kind of judge? And for the longest time, I didn't know who that judge was going to be. Mm -hmm. I simply knew that she was making some kind of plea for herself, for her decisions, that there was a quality of guilt involved, but also, more than anything else, a desire to be understood. Mm -hmm to be seen and to be understood as she was. Um, and, and, and then that b began to influence how I thought about all of the pieces of the novel as they came into existence. Each of the characters is making a kind of plea. I mean, you quoted Aaron, who's the Israeli father, who says, pass over it. To me, that was one of the most exciting voices of the book, or the one where I felt very, very, very close to something uh, that felt very real to me. Um, and the, the, the sense of this, this person who was at the end of his life, who had raised this child without ever feeling like he had understood him, who loved him so much, but felt in some ways that he had never, he had, he had been um, kept out of the relationship that the son had with his mother. That to me was a kind of revelation I had right in the character. In the beginning I thought, here's just this guy who's kind of a tyrannical father. Mm -hmm really unkind to his son. Why do I care about him so much? Mm -hmm. Why do I have this empathy for him? I have to understand this. And so writing him was this journey to understand that. And at some point I suddenly realized 
that, that very fact that here is a person who from the first moment of his son's life felt, and I think this happens very often when, with parents and children, that he hadn't, wasn't the one who had the understanding with this child that his wife did. And he felt somehow betrayed by that. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and only at the end of his life is he sort of making this confession to this now grown chi estranged child who's out wandering in the hills of Jerusalem at night while the father's you know, having this whole interior monologue with himself, mm -hmm. his plea for a final effort at um, expressing that love, mm -hmm. understanding that, that grown child. It's such a poignant moment in the novel when he describes um, the way his brand newborn son kind of looked him over, like, you know, kind of looked him up and down as in sort of, are you worthy of being my father? <laughs> and, uh, to, you know, such a projection on his part, but the suffering that he carries because of how he interprets yeah. that moment. Well, I, I mean, I started writing Great House soon after my first son was born, and then while in the during the course of writing it, I had another child. And I think the book, to me, though it may not seem this way on the surface, will always seem to me the only mechanism I could have invented to capture all of the feeling that was born in me when I had children. And I don't think I could have ever written the part of that father, who obviously is, again, so far from me, uh, but without having had a child and understanding something of that relationship. And there are bits of, of Aaron, of the father. For example, the, the part where um, his son, Dov, discovers death for the first time as a three-year-old boy mm -hmm. that came directly out of conversations with my son. This, that, you know, that moment, um, everyone who has a child will know that, that moment where your child suddenly discovers that it doesn't all go on forever. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you, um, the shock of that um, how does one deal with that? And so there are so many things um, that were felt so personal to me went into that, but at the same time, it, it was absolutely this imagination of this other person, this other character, who, is so, who on the surface is so distant from mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has, he has a surprising vulnerability, considering that he is this very autocratic and, and almost um, cruel father in mm. many ways. I also love that... Um, that you do build this empathy um, for unlikely people for mm -hmm. us. I mean, the parental roles in this novel are fairly complex, I would say extremely <coughs> complex. And so I'm wondering about your experience of empathizing with your characters and then how do you let them go? Is it hard for you to let go of your characters when you, when you do that thing where you turn around and close the door? Mm. Well, I, I know that when I started Great House, it was important to me, uh, as it wasn't when I wrote The History of Love, to, to write characters who, in a way, give you the most difficult parts of themselves first, or rather, to say it a different way, that don't ask you to love them. And mm -hmm. when I was writing The History of Love, although I may not have been so aware of it at the beginning, Looking back, I think it was really important to me that as soon as you opened The History of Love and met Leo Gursky and met Alma Singer, that you love them. They ask you to love them. Yeah. They're charming. And that was in one experience, and it, was a, and it was a joy to write that. But I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to, s uh, still thinking about empathy, as I probably will my whole life as a writer, I wanted to see what it would be like to write characters who are thorny, who are difficult, who in a way confess shameful things to mm. you about themselves from the beginning. And it is, it is they who are telling you that about themselves. So if they are, there must be in them a kind of honesty. Um, and, and I thought, if you stayed with these people for long enough, like Nadia with all of her self-doubt, or Aaron, this father, with all of his um, kind of moral doubt, mm -hmm. I think, or Arthur, the husband, I mean, if you stayed with them for long enough, would you would you empathize with them? Because of course I, I, I did, I wanted mm -hmm. to. Um, I just wanted to understand the nature of that empathy. Um, so it was, it's kind of idea of an empathy that's much more hard won mm -hmm. than any other um, characters that I'd ever written. And then do you miss them when they're oh, gone? Oh, do I miss them? Um, I'm, yes, I miss writing when I'm, I mean, I'm just a, 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 sh a shell of a person when I'm not <laughs> writing them. It's terrible to be in between books. and. It's one of the things, you know, I really, sometimes I think it's almost not worth it. I mean, 
I should have done something else. It would have been... Play a suspended you, piano, perhaps. Uh, yeah, play a suspended <laughs> piano, absolutely. I think I am playing a suspended <laughs> piano. That's the problem. I mean, it feels like that mm -hmm. difficult and complicated sometimes. And um, I know that when I'm writing a novel, we talked about this a little bit before, everything feels like in the world that it has a place, that it can make sense. Everything I read, no matter how strange or obscure from each other, everything I see, every conversation I hear, somehow speaks to it. And it's like the novel is this structure that can hold it and capture it and give it meaning. Um, and I find that I take those little bits of things and I can juxtapose them. And in the juxtaposition, I discover new meanings. And there's something so joyful about that. Suddenly, life makes a kind of sense. Um, and I think that when I'm not working, um, and I don't have the company of not just the characters, but the company of that shape, um, that sort of formal structure which is always emerging and gives everything a kind of place. I, I find that very, very hard mm. because it seems like everything sort of passes by. Um, but yeah, writing is, I, I once wrote, as a young person, I wrote to an author when I, I uh, had read a book of his that I liked. And I said, thank you, your book was really great company. And he wrote back and said, you have no idea um, how much company it was to me. Mm. And I think that is, you know, it is the greatest form of company you can have to create this world um, and exist in it as mm. long as you can make it last. Mm. That makes me think about the character, um, Mr. Bender, and, oh. and this image of, that gets repeated a couple of times in, in Great House, the image of bending around a shape of absence, and which kind of brings us back to the beginning of the conversation and this feeling that um, maybe you have to become deeply connected to the absent space so that you can find the shape around that space. And so when you're between books, you haven't yet located that new I think so. Shape. I think there's a way in which you have to find an urgency. And the urgency develops with time as one changes emotionally, but it also, um, it's hard work to find it. It doesn't just, I don't know how other writers work, but inspiration or urgency doesn't just hit me. I have to go searching and turn things over. And, and as I'm turning all these things over, I'm actually like taking myself apart to some mm -hmm. degree. You take yourself apart and it's, that's a very, very painful thing to do. It's much more pleasurable to put yourself together, which <laughs> is what you're doing when you're writing mm -hmm. a book. Mm -hmm. But first you have to take yourself apart and find the things, the, the rawness and the urgency that's there. And you don't, you can't articulate it at first, and the, the novel is an effort to articulate it and make sense out of it. But that's hard, and, I, and I, I have come to believe that that period between novels is as important, is as much writing as the writing itself. Um, but it certainly isn't fun. <laughs> I, so I guess that precludes the question of what you are working on now because it doesn't exist yet. Is there, well, is there any hint? Well, it exists in terms yeah. of there's lots of papers. Yeah. Um, there's lots of writing and papers, but I don't know what it is yet. So the and mess. There's, yeah, there's the, the mess. mess yeah. and, there, and there are those, I, I talked a little bit about these strange ideas that I had early on in writing Great House. One was the shark or the suspended piano. There was another that was this obsession I had with transplanted rooms. All I could think about when I started Great House was this Francis Bacon studio in London, this painter Francis Bacon, whose painting studio was like this huge mess and was taken apart into like 10,000 billion pieces after he died and then reassembled in Dublin. And I got obsessed with that, and then I started thinking about Freud's study, which was taken, mm -hmm. you know, he, his family took it apart in Vienna in 1938 and then resurrected it in London and where he lived for another year before he died, and it's still there. You can go, and like his glasses are still on the table where mm -hmm. he put them down right before he died. I started thinking about this idea of transplanted rooms, and that became really important in Greece. So I have a lot of things like that, but they're inexplicable to me. And mm -hmm. um, they're just these obsessions that my mind keeps working through um, without being able to explain why. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to believe that, they, that I will at some point be able to explain them. Um, and then I'll be back here, I hope. Yeah, well, uh, we are all <laughs> looking forward to the next one, I'm sure. I, I think maybe that's the perfect moment to segue into um, you guys that we can now see. Um, so we've got, I think, um, Stephanie's going to take over with mics out there. Please raise your hand, and we're going to take questions um, on alternating sides. 
and then I'm waiting for Andy on the other side. And uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Barbara's actually going to take it, Andy. Questions? Stephanie, there's one over here in the blue. Pati patience for the mic that's coming. Thank you. <laughs> this is not the magic part of the day. Yeah. Hello, thank you. Uh, my question is about the desk. Uh, you didn't mention it in any of your discussions, and it seemed to me the desk was almost like a character in the book. Could you talk a little bit about what the desk meant to you? Sure. Um, it's interesting about the desk because that is sort of the takeaway image of the book, and it actually surprised me how much the desk was spoken about after the novel was published, but of course it shouldn't have surprised me. The desk is critical. One thing I will say, just before I talk more about the desk itself, is that I really thought of this novel as a novel without a center. So I like the way you describe it. The desk is like a character, but it's one of many characters. Um, and it, it, it was a way um, to see, for certain ideas to move through the book um, and to transform throughout the course of writing the book. The desk in each character's hands, I think, becomes something different. It's strange to have this enormous, blocky desk actually be something very malleable. And I think it had to have all these drawers because it contains so many different kinds of ideas. The very um, strange thing, maybe, which I can share with you about the desk is that when I, st I told you I had written first a short story, which is the beginning of the book with Nadia, who receives the desk from Daniel Varsky, this Chilean poet. And I had written that, uh, just written the story without really thinking about where the idea came from or why I'd written it, which is the way that, I, that people should write. You shouldn't have to answer questions in advance, only afterwards and maybe then not even. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but I, I published it and then it was in uh, an anthology of short stories and, and the editors asked for a little paragraph about uh, you know how the book had how the story had come to be, so I went upstairs to my study, which is on the top floor of my house, and I sat down to think about where did this story come from, and as I was thinking about it, I was looking up at my own desk. Now I say up because my desk that I work on at home, or at, at least the one at which I wrote this novel, Great House, is this tremendous, overbearing desk, absolutely huge. It takes up a whole wall. It has this. Um, wall of shelves and, and drawers, not 19, but a lot of them that extends sort of up, up the wall. And on top of all that, it's ugly and I've always hated it. <laughs> and I started to think how strange it was that I'd written this short story about this terribly overbearing desk, so full of memory and feeling, without making the connection with my own desk. And, it, <laughs> I just, and then I began to think about the idea of these blinders, which I think uh, writers put on themselves, or at least I do, um, not, not consciously, of course, but they allow us, w when we forget the origins of what we're writing about, or the, the way that the things that we're writing about are tethered to reality and real people and real experiences, if we f can forget that, then we're free. I had talked about that idea of, of freedom before, how important that is. If you forget that, you're sort of free to invent and to s also to say things, to imbue those stories and people with risky things, risky meanings, to expose things um, that you couldn't otherwise do if you knew you were writing kind of one-to-one -one and one-to-one -one ratio with life. So here's this desk uh, that I didn't know that I was writing about and yet I was writing about. But what could be like so personal and exposing about a desk? So I started to think more about that and then I started to think about how the desk was in the house when I moved into it and it hadn't been, so I hadn't chosen, it had been built like to like these very esoteric specifications by the former owner of the house. Um, when he left, he, I guess it had been built around this painted, large painted panel, which must have been valuable to him, so he like wrenched it out. So there's this huge gaping hole <laughs> above my head, and then I've tried to, f to like fill it with like 
bulletin boards that would always fall on my head and so <laughs> and, like, and finally I had to just accept the fact that there was just like this gaping hole above my head and that was what it was going to be. And somehow that, then I heard about this idea of like the burden of, of inheritance basically about how we're bound in some ways to these things that we inherit, not desks, of course, like not material things, but just uh, I, emotional inheritance. Now I realize that I was really is what I was writing about. And suddenly that made absolutely perfect sense to me as this mother of a new child who made me think constantly about w what it was that I was passing down to him. I mean, not in terms of family history per se, but in terms of like emotional history or a, an emotional way of looking at the world. So things that you can't even control or are not aware of passing down to a child, but which suddenly were of, of tremendous importance to me. So all of that was contained, all of that mm -hmm. was contained in just this instinct to write about this huge desk. And then it gave me a novel. So now I'm really indebted to it and I have to keep writing at this terrible thing. <laughs> Our next question is right here in the middle. I have a desk too, but it doesn't have any meaning to me. Maybe that says something. Mm -hmm. My question is how you worked out your writing life with you having such small children and a family life. I think that's kind of an uh, important question for women. A lot of women have that, that issue. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I'm not sure that there's any easy answer to it. But what I can say, I remember when I was pregnant with my older son, I was being interviewed by an Italian journalist in Milan. And she said to me, oh, I really liked your last book, but <laughs> I guess that's it for you. Like, <laughs> so <over> now. <laughs> and there's, there's this little bit of glee in her eye when she said it, and I thought to myself, like, you're, you're so wrong. You're going to be so wrong. You'll see how wrong you're going to be. And I remember it was almost a challenge in my mind of, like, it, it just that she just cannot be right about that. Um, and really, to my surprise, what, I, what I'll say is that despite the enormous complications of time. That's the real problem, is time. It's, but despite all of that, there's some way to figure out the whole problem of time. To me, having a child, having children, has so deepened my experience of life, of the world, of my relationship with other people. It's made me even more sensitive, unfortunately, because it was already hard enough, but now I feel even more vulnerable, and somehow there's the kind of rawness with having you're exposed in a way when you have children and th all of that went into the book and I think I hope that the book um, kind of trembles with that so in that way there's no um, they're not at odds with each other they, 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 they live really beautifully being a parent giving oneself over to that and giving oneself over to one's work can live really beautifully together um, the other things are difficult um, but there are solutions to them. Um, and I'm still sort of committed to that idea. So I haven't yet, I've only written one book as a mother. Um, and we'll talk again in another five years. <laughs> Maybe I'll have revised what I think about it. Um, but I really think that it's not just possible, but it's actually wonderful, wonderful for the work. The next question's right here again in the middle. Thank you for those three books, which, which were all wonderful, and I've enjoyed all three of them. Thank you. Uh, I have to say that my favorite of the three was the first, uh, mm -hmm. Man Walks Into the Room. She's been downhill since then. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, no, it's been uphill, and that's mm -hmm. my question. I was delighted to hear you say that in a way you, thought of, you, th you think of these, or maybe you just thought of them as a, as a, as a trio. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I like The Man Walks Into the Room best because I'm a very simplistic reader, and it, it was the more uh, sequential. Mm -hmm. But I think with the, with the theme of memory, you seem to have carried the three books on to such a complex nature. So yeah. my question is, did you consciously think of these when you, st when you were uh, during the, uh, the writing of these as, as a trilogy, or did you, or, and all, also did you think of these as becoming more and more complex with the, with the underlying issue of memory uh, as the basis. Yeah, that's a very good and fair question, and I, I think it's, I think you're right uh, um, that they have become more complex, more demanding. They've become more demanding of me, in a way, and so subsequently more demanding of you, the reader. I didn't think of them as a trilogy, but what, what I mean by that is when I look back, you, you see 
you see your mind at work, you see like your, your emotional life um, exposed, and so you see the, how everything is connected. It, I mean, in, in each of us, there are a, a, a not infinite set of concerns. There are many concerns, but they're related, and when you, when you write or you create anything, I think you suddenly, that's like brought to the surface, so you, you see it. Um, and it was inevitable that I would see the connections between those things and see them in, in the books. But um, I think in terms of the demanding quality or the complexity, I think I've just followed my instinct. Um, and grown more and more interested and excited by the ways in which a, a, a narrative that isn't linear, as man walks into a room is, can offer all kinds of possibilities that I think that more linear narrative doesn't. Um, one of those, maybe the most important of those, is the element for me as the writer, and really for you as the reader too, of um, discovery, of surprise and discovery. When I go into the novels, I, don't, I know very little, and with each novel I've known less going in about what's going to happen, who these characters are, and what they're going to tell me about all kinds of things. And when, I begin to, when they begin to play off each other, they expose things and um, they make this shape that I never could have possibly come up with on my own had I blocked out the book in advance. So when the, if, now that I've gotten interested in that, now that I see how, um, how exciting it is to write a book, that is a process of discovery rather than one of like explication or um, an illustration of an idea one had. I'm kind of addicted to it. And I, I think the results, I know the result is more demanding. I hope in s on some level though it also gives more because if something is demanded of you, it also, I hope, returns that, that effort. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate that you stayed with me all these books. I hope I don't, <laughs> I hope I don't lose you. Mm -hmm. Last two questions, they're up here. Um, you mentioned quickly that memory to you is kind of an imaginative act. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that idea. Yeah, I, I remember thinking about this a lot as I was writing Man Walks Into a Room, that the idea in which so much of our lives is actually um, forgotten, basically, and that that which our minds decide to remember, or what, what we salvage um, of our experience, are these unique moments that we then string together into this narrative. And I think that we do that because we need, the brain needs coherence. I was thinking a lot about like Oliver Sacks actually when I was writing Man Walks Into a Room, and, and I think all of his books in some way are about no matter how damaged the brain is, it always finds this kind of amazing and special way of creating a new coherence. I mean, that's one of the fascinating things about the brain. And, and I, I, it's also one of the fascinating things about um, this cre idea of the creation of, of the self, which I think is fundamentally um, willful, I guess, in some way. So even though we're not aware of, like, oh, I'm going to choose to remember this and not this, and obviously it's not conscious, but it is um, a choice. And so when you say, okay, well here, this happened to me, and this, and this, and this, and this, and you string it all together, you have this, this narrative of you that makes a kind of sense. Um, but you've created, and then I subsequently became interested in, the, say, so what if something, some huge loss, or something shakes that coherence completely? How do you respond to that? And what, how do you recreate that coherence in the aftermath of that? Um, I, I find that exciting. I guess I find the idea of like a self that we're born into or that is created for us by our families, or our backgrounds. I find that a kind of deadening idea because we're locked into things. But I find the idea of like our own um, place in that, our own power in that, really exciting. Okay, we're going to squeeze in two more questions mm -hmm. if we make them brief. Yes, in the uh, first chapter of A uh, Great House. Uh, Nadia, the novelist, uh, writes about the content of, of her books that she's written, and she writes, um, yet I believed that the writer should not be cramped by the possible consequences of her work. In her work, the writer is free of laws, but in her life, your honor, she is not free. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you, you know, if you feel that in your own writing. Uh, yeah, of course. Freedom. I mean, I, f I feel that in life we aren't free. I feel that, I feel that in life we, 
there are these expectations, whether they be our own, whether they be social expectations, there are all these kinds of things that, that block us into a kind of received way of thinking about things and, and, and being, fundamentally. And for me, always, and I remember this from the time I was like 14 years old and starting to write, not seriously, but just you know scribbling, there was this immense excitement about the idea of having complete control over what of a world, of a being, of a way of not just expressing oneself, but actually making oneself. Um, because when you write something, you bring, you, know, you bring it into existence. I think that over the course of writing all of these books, that's also what I've been doing, is like creating a self um, in, some, in some way. Um, and I think that you know, it's when I lose that freedom is probably when I, I won't be able to write anymore. Last question up here at the top. Hi, Nicole. Um, mine's a two-parter. One is how you, um, what helps you balance your public life with your personal life? And then also I wanted to know um, how you think things like Facebook and Twitter add to the, you know, when you're talking about the complexity of finding time, how those things um, you know, um, either make it more of a challenge to find the time, and uh, if it affects you as a writer. Well, I don't, I don't, I've never twittered and or looked at a Twitter, and I don't have Facebook. I've never been on Facebook, so I guess those have been. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If it, in, another audience would boo me out of the room with that. Um, and, and probably rightly, there's something to be said for being with and of one's time. And in a certain way, I sometimes feel like I've, I've dropped out of time in that way. Um, but I just, I, I can't get excited about it. I just can't. And, and it just seems to me, like Facebook seems to me, from what I understand of it, and like from what I understand of it has come from like, Zadie Smith writing about it in the New York Review of Books. I'm obviously no expert, mm -hmm. um, but from what I understand of it it, it, it really like limits the possibility of the self. Rather, I, we've just had you know just talking about this another question about this idea of like these infinite possibilities of, of 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 expressing oneself or making oneself. And Facebook seems to me somehow to limit that um, and, and make that very very flat in a way. And it's just not, also the idea of like keeping in touch and all these things, I mean, I, I know how to do that. I've known how to do that all my life. Um, um, <clears throat> and Twitter, like I can't, you know, it's like I've spent my life like expanding, like why would I want only a, like a few characters, a few words to write? Like I'm, I'm like <laughs> trying to fill like many, many pages of it. It's just the, the exact opposite of, of all of my instincts in life. Um, so there's that. And, um, and that may be a problem for me as time passes. I mean, I, I don't know whether that will be, is it necessary to do those things for, for people to know about one's work? I don't know, but um, I guess I'll have lost that game if so, but that's okay with me. Um, and, the, and the other thing about balancing a public life and a private life, I don't, I am not aware of having a public life except when suddenly I find myself on, in a stage in front of all of you. Um, the rest of my life is changing dirty diapers, um, you know, showing up at my desk for work, reading, um, having some friends over for brunch, like that's life, the same as, as everyone else. And I, I don't have ver much of a reflection of um, something outside of that, except in these almost dreamlike experiences, um, mm. where suddenly I'm like gushing about um, all of these private interior things in front of, I don't know how many of you are here, 400 <laughs> people or something. Um, it's a very strange thing, but I am aware, I'm very aware of how important it is to me to have like readers like you. I mean, it's, I mean it has made, um, it is such a joy. To, to write a book and know that there will be people to read it. It's not one that I've always, I've always known in my life, and it may not be one I always know in my life, but for the time being, um, that idea of a public life, of knowing that that stuff that one works on enslaves it for so many years um, without anyone seeing it, and then the fact that it gets read in this really intimate way, and the conversation is, um, goes on beyond oneself, is so incredibly gratifying. We are so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> um,
not to, not to abbreviate the applause. Um, just a reminder that um, Nicole and I will be out in the atrium, um, happy to sign books and talk to you. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. <laughs>